Somewhere in the quaint town of Bedford, England, there is a box. Worn and weathered, its exact location unknown to all but a chosen few. It is a casket of prophecies, an ark of providence that must remain sealed until a day of crisis shall come to pass, and twenty-four bishops of the Church of England shall bear witness to its opening. For when it is opened, the world's days are sure to be numbered, and only the scripture inside will save those who open their hearts. All this was foretold by the Mother of God, no, not her, this one, in 1814. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Quoting Dickens is a cliche now, but I bring him up because the era he was describing was that of a woman he mentions by name on the same page, Miss Joanna Southcott, the woman who would be the mother of God. Joanna Southcott was raised on her father's farm in the rustic English town of Gitcham. She knew Jesus from an age too early to recall. Her father gave her pop quizzes on scripture, her mother may have been gifted with prophetic visions, and her aunt, having found little happiness in her failed attempts at marriage, had long since turned to meditations on Christ. A vain girl by her own account, Joanna caught the eye of a handful of love interests, which by my calculations must have been every bachelor in Gitcham. A few romances almost arrived at that point of holy matrimony, only to be thwarted at the last moment. And what does a Gitchum girl do when men let you down? You turn to Jesus. And her faith was rewarded, for Joanna was soon introduced to her final suitor, the Holy Spirit. And yes, the spirit is a lover, and a sensual one at that. In one of her writings, she says the Holy Spirit called itself a romantic rival to her first love. She even describes a semi-erotic encounter she had with Jesus in her bed, whose hand felt as perfect as ever women felt the hand of her husband. But more importantly, the spirit talks to Joanna and gives her knowledge of that which will come upon the whole earth. Feeling a little flushed, Joanna goes to talk with her Bible study group about these visions and prophecies she's getting, but the others just sit and stare. She is touched by Satan! <laughs> Am not and I'll prove it! The Holy Spirit continues to speak to her and she starts writing down all of its predictions and keeping them in her box, which would later become known as The Box. Everyone else tells her, pshaw, a big war around the corner? Yeah, right. It's 1792. France is tearing itself apart in a revolution. We win. This is the end of history. But then, of course, Napoleon happened and Europe went to war for 25 years. And Joanna's predictions keep being right, at least according to Joanna. But Joanna doesn't want to just be right, she needs someone to prove she's right. If this is the real Holy Spirit, the church ought to know about it, and if it isn't, well, she would sure like to know. But the Church of England refuses to write back to her because it's nearly impossible to prove that A. Someone 100% can't see the future, and B. 100% isn't getting their visions from Satan. The Church just isn't in the business of entertaining any unfalsifiable claims that aren't already canon, you know? So Joanna does the next best thing. She puts all of her writings together into a book and uses her savings to bring it to a publisher in 1801. Joanna's politics were pretty tame, no revolutions here, but her theology was radical. She taught that since it was Eve who misled Adam to eating the apple, it's a woman's job to guide mankind back to the path of righteousness. Joanna claimed to be the woman of the apocalypse, a figure heralding Christ's return ahead of the end of days. For the people of London who read her book, they look at the last decade of war and the threat of a French invasion and the hunger caused by two years of poor harvests, and they they say she might be on to something here. And look, her prophecies even rhyme! Inspired by her book, a handful of men make the pilgrimage to meet Joanna, and they tell her she needs to come to London to continue spreading her message. Part of me wonders just what sort of influence they had on her from that point on. One man in particular had sold his soul to three other prophets already and strikes me as something of a huckster. Because things changed when Joanna made it to London. She started selling Seals of the Lord, which were just 
pieces of paper with her signature on them. They were supposed to protect the faithful from the French army when they invaded, and by some accounts, guarantee salvation. She was selling eternal life. That, that, that's like... Like, that's what broke the Catholic Church. The biggest thing with Protestantism is that everyone got sick of the Pope selling get-out-of-purgatory cards. This was potentially that, but worse. She sold thousands of these seals in her first few years in London, but the flood of new converts... Well, let's be honest, it was never a flood, really, but let's say a stream. That stream dried to a trickle as the years went on, and the French invasion and the end of days never came. And that's where she might have faded into obscurity, but in 1814, she felt a kick. Southcott, still a virgin, shares the good news with her followers. She'd promised years ago that she was the woman of the apocalypse, the woman in the book of revelations who gives birth to the Messiah before the war in heaven and judgment day. And here at last, the Messiah was ready to make his entrance. And when the doctors confirmed the pregnancy was real, all of London took notice. One record describes how, yeah, there was still a major war going on with France and another one with America, but all that Londoners could talk about was this miracle child. The predicted day of the child's birth arrives, and he isn't delivered. And then as Joanna moves into her 10th and 11th month of pregnancy, people are really wondering just what the heck is going on. Well, Doctor, miracle births are sort of an understudied phenomenon, and we don't know how long this may take. Uh-huh. Well, here's my prediction. She's not pregnant. She's sick. I give her about two weeks. Joanna Southcott died a few days after Christmas, 1814. Her followers didn't let anyone collect the body for several days, just in case she came back, until the body started to decompose. All right, it's a bit unseemly, I'll grant you that. Let's, uh, let's just tuck her away until she comes back, which she definitely will. But what of the box? <laughs> Ever since Joanna moved to London, the box had been in possession of that man, Mr. Sharp, and now he would use it to continue Joanna's message. The box was already important to Joanna's followers. It was used in two incidents, famous among the handful of Southcottians that still roamed the earth, called the first and second trial. Trial is being generous, if you ask me. They were more like exhibitions. The first time the box was opened was to show some non-believers Joanna's writings and see if they'd change their minds. The second time the box was opened was for the benefit of a crowd of Southcottians, almost literally preaching to the choir. But Joanna wrote of a third trial and things that had been placed inside the box that she could not yet reveal. As far as I can tell, sometime shortly after Joanna's death, the third trial took on a new meaning to her followers, connected with the end of the world, which would happen in the fourth year of the century. Not sure which century, though. 1904 and 2004 have turned out to be duds, but 2104 is looking promising. You'd think Joanna's death would be the end of things, but a Mr. Sharp was very quick to come to the late Miss Southcott's defense. Brothers and sisters, Joanna Southcott is dead. But on this same day, news has reached us of peace with America. It is a sign in anticipation of peace on Earth. The child was not delivered physically, no, but spiritually. He has arrived in heaven, watching over us now, and will return to us as a man, a conqueror, to reign on Earth as in heaven. When would the second coming of Jesus come for a second time? One man had the answer. George Turner used to be a madman raving in front of Westminster Palace. Death to turnpikes! Death to postage stamps! I demand 300,000 servants! But now, now Turner was a prophet and legally sane. The promised child, named Shiloh, would appear six years after Joanna Southcott's death as a six-year-old in London on October 14th, 1820. On the 10th of April, 1821! Uh Soon! George Turner died later that year. But not before a new prophet took his place. John Rowe was one of Joanna's followers who started listening to George Turner. But when Turner said Shiloh would appear in 1820, John Rowe said... He said no. 
No, he wasn't gonna come in 1820. And when indeed the child did not come as foretold, Turner's followers turned to Roe and declared, This man said the Savior wouldn't be born on this day! And he wasn't! He knows the future! All hail the great prophet! All hail! John Rowe took on the mantle with pride, and led his followers to a small town outside of Manchester, which he proclaimed would be the New Jerusalem. He started bringing back a bunch of Old Testament laws, kosher meat, circumcision, full beards, black, broad-brimmed hat. I mean, you'd see his posse walking through town and think they were Hasidic Jews. They didn't really know what they were doing, though. One of John's followers got a circumcision so wrong he killed a boy, only to be acquitted because the actual Jewish community had to step in and say, Please don't outlaw circumcision on account of these doofuses. Toda, brother! Yahweh be praised! You're not affiliated with me! John Rowe was also known to perform miracles, sometimes. But it all started to go wrong when he commanded that he be given seven virgins to cherish and comfort him while he went on tour to spread the word of God. The townsfolk were quite disappointed to see that one of them was pregnant when she returned. Oh my god, her father cried. When you said you wanted my virgin daughter to cherish and comfort you, I never expected you meant like this. But Roe doubled down. This girl wasn't pregnant with his son, she was pregnant with the Son of God. He promised the arrival of Shiloh, the new messiah! The baby ends up being a girl, which is a little awkward. Perhaps if John had told the people Shiloh was going to be a trans man, he might have escaped their ire. But instead, he was kicked out of his own New Jerusalem. So where is a good South Cotian to turn after being burned by their last three prophets? Look no further, friends. John Ward is here for you. John Ward was a man who had dabbled in many faiths. He'd been a Calvinist and a Methodist before swearing he was never going to have anything to do with religion ever again. Then he joined the Baptists, the Independents, the Sandemanians, story for another time, and then shortly after Joanna Southcott's death, one of her books caught his attention. John Ward fell in love with what Southcott had to say, but he never quite fit in with the other Southcottians, so he made his own religion. He discovered a new prophet to follow, a woman named Mary Boone, who claimed to be Joanna Southcott reborn. Then he got bored of her and started having his own prophetic visions. Ward decided that the Bible wasn't an account of past events, it was a description of future events. So Shiloh wasn't just the second coming of Jesus, he was also the first coming of Jesus? Joanna Southcott, the original, dead Joanna Southcott, told him so in a vision, and she told Mr. Ward that he was Shiloh all along. In fact, he was Shiloh, and Shiloh was Christ, and before becoming Christ, he was the devil, and the devil was the son of God. I am Adam, as I am Judah, as I am Elijah. There is no name in scripture which I may not with propriety apply to myself. I am one. I am that I am. He just sorta died in 1837, and you know what? All things considered, this is the good ending. Ward's followers didn't have much of a public mission and didn't care to evangelize, so they mostly just sat around reading his books and going, hmm, yep, good stuff, while the ministry slowly shrank over the years. Let us take a brief intermission and return our attention to the box. For as long as the box has been around, someone has been trying to open it. When Mr. Sharp got on in years, he left the box in the care of Mrs. Townley, one of the women who wrote down a large number of Joanna's prophecies, with whom it would remain until 1825. After her death, the box passed to a Mr. Foley, a reverend and early convert to Southcottianism. Mr. Foley left the box to his son, Foley Jr., but another follower argued that she should have it because she really, really wanted it. When that failed, she started a petition to get Foley Jr. to hand over the box. When that failed, she disguised herself as a man and broke into his house, only to run face to face into Foley Jr. on her way out with what she thought was the box in tow. Foley Jr. confiscated the stolen property, but the thief wasn't done yet. She told the whole South Cotian church that yes, she may have tried to steal their most sacred relic, but Foley Jr. had done something far worse. 
he'd opened the box. Foley Jr. was compelled to confess that yes, he'd opened the box, but only the outer box that held the box, because he thought his dad might have hidden a bunch of money in there, but the box remained sealed for the time being. We now return to the small town outside of Manchester, once known as the New Jerusalem. Twenty years after John Rowe was chased out of town, a stranger with an American accent sets down his bags in the town square. My name is James Jersham Jezreel. I'm handing out copies of my new book, and I'm here to continue the work of John Rowe. You see, after losing his followers in England, John Rowe continued to foster a successful ministry in the United States and Australia, where he made a tidy profit encouraging his followers to buy fake jewelry from him. Jezreel had made a pilgrimage to the place where it all started, but was quite disappointed when the folks of New Jerusalem burned every copy he gave them. Jezreel was disappointed, you see, because he had come with a very important message to share with the world. All these prophets who'd come and died without any sign of Shiloh, they were all correct, and they were all prophets. The book of Revelations mentions seven angels with seven trumpets, which really means seven prophets, and Jezreel was the sixth. And then, after the seventh, Shiloh will come. Honestly, kudos. If you want me to buy into your new religion, I am more likely to believe that you believe it if you are not the main character. Jezreel traveled far and wide to spread his message, but everywhere he turned, no one would hear him. So he settled down in a sleepy little town in the UK, and decided, if he couldn't bring his message to the world, he would bring the world to him. He built a meeting hall in town, filled it with music, and little by little, people came. His followers were mostly shopkeepers, artisans, that sort of thing, so he built shops for them to work. He built a college to attract young minds from far and wide, Israel's International College in the middle of scenic Gillingham. All of his followers gave from their own incomes to make it happen, but together, they made it happen without going bust. As a matter of fact, they had enough money to keep building. Jezreel had a vision for a gigantic temple that will be a religious headquarters and a sanctuary for the faithful during the Last Judgment. It was a magnificent structure, but he died shortly after the foundations were set. His wife Clarissa took over and was determined to see it finished. She went as far as to micromanage her followers' diets to make sure they had enough money to give to the temple, while she sat back and snacked on tea cakes. But the project proved to be too much, and the tower sat unfinished for decades. The temple got repossessed in 1905 and sold to some businessmen who wanted to demolish it, but because the temple was designed to survive the literal apocalypse, it was so expensive to tear down that the contractors hired to do so went bankrupt before they could finish. In World War II, the British military used it as a target for anti-aircraft guns, and it survived until the 1960s. When they finally did tear it down, God must have been mad because a worker was crushed to death under a hundred tons of concrete. James Jersham Jezreel died before the seventh prophet revealed himself, but it didn't take long, and he would come from the unlikeliest of places. In 1895, in the small town of Benton Harbor, Michigan, a couple named Mr. and Mrs. Purnell had a happy announcement to make about a child coming into their lives. The spirit of Shiloh has grafted with us. We are become the final prophet, successor to Southcott. The Purnells began a commune and, like the others before them, got a few hundred followers to pitch in. They owned a thousand acres of land, which they used to grow their own crops and provide themselves with a few other basic necessities. But make no mistake, this was no humble project. The Purnells created their own electric grid in 1905. Their commune, known as the House of David, was also weirdly famous for completely non-religious reasons. Benjamin Purnell, otherwise known as King Ben, believed that baseball built character. So he encouraged all his members to play ball as a spiritual exercise. He made his team follow a grueling schedule and sent them on tour around America to make money for their families and spread the prophet's good word. At one point, he started hiring professional players from the major league and of course making them play with fake beards so that they would match the other commune members. And on top of their nationally recognized baseball team, the House of David had three brass bands, two orchestras, an aviary, a zoo, and an amusement park. 
I mean, imagine that. Imagine today if there were a troop of traveling players with nationwide acclaim that turned out to be part of some new religious movement peddling conspiracy theories. The amusement park is still open, by the way. Pretty sure it's not run by the House of David anymore, though. You see, the multi-millionaire Ben Purnell stopped appearing in public sometime in the 20s, and then the cops showed up to raid the commune in 1926. King Ben was so prudish as to forbid sex between husbands and wives, but all along, he was using his religious authority to fool around with 14-year-olds. Allegedly, anyway. There was a huge public trial, but he died in the middle of it. It's said his body was mummified and is held in a glass coffin, kept hidden by the House of David, who await his resurrection. It's also speculated he might have faked his death and run off with enough cash to live in obscurity. I guess we'll never know. And through it all... The box Sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. remained. It continued to sit in the family home of its custodian. Actually, it was sitting there long enough that mice had started to chew through the outer box, so they put the box inside of a box inside of another box. Three boxes is a more Bible-y sort of number anyway. I can only assume that John Rowe's missions to America had aroused new interest in the box, because one American called in to say God had asked him to take it away from the family home, to which the custodian dutifully replied, he would hand it over as soon as God made a reservation. The custodian passed away in 1898 and with his last dying breath tasked his son to take up the oath of box keeper. And he had to contend with another American who crossed the Atlantic seven times trying to find and steal the box. I shouldn't be surprised to learn that the American's name was Dr. Indiana Jones. It might surprise you at this point to learn that the original South Cotians were still around in the 1920s and 30s, but in fact, they were a bigger deal in those decades than they had ever been since Joanna died. A few close friends got together to form the Panacea Society in 1909, so named because their mission was to cure the world of all sickness and strife by finally opening Joanna Southcott's box. There had been previous attempts to summon the 24 bishops in the past, during World War I and the Crimean War, but, well, come on. Joanna Southcott lived through Napoleon. You think the Crimean War is the crisis that will herald the apocalypse? What is the fourth horseman Florence Nightingale? That's weak sauce with a side of flimsy nuggets. Still, in the 20s and 30s, the Panacea Society put up billboards in London saying, Crime and banditry, distress and perplexity will increase in England until the bishops open Joanna Southcott's box. They ran ads at least through the 90s, even as their budget got smaller and smaller. But still, whenever the Daily Mail couldn't fill up all its ad spots, they had the Southcottians on speed dial. To be honest, I think I understand why they used the Crimean War or perplexity as an excuse, because I want to know what's in that box. Egg on my face if I accidentally provoke the apocalypse, but I hereby proclaim myself to be the American of this generation with an unhealthy obsession. I think it's high time the Church of England sent over half their bishops on sabbatical to open this darn box and study its contents just so we can say we did it. Well. There was one man who said he did it. There was a man in the 20s named Harry Price who specialized in debunking the supernatural, and he claimed to have got a hold of the box in 1927, only to find inside some loose papers, cards, a horse pistol. But although he may have been in the business of exposing fraudsters, his own claims are somewhat dubious. The Panacea Society claims they still have the real box, even though, no, you can't see it, it goes to a different school. But then again, with all these thieves running around, you can understand why they might want to keep the location of the real one a secret. I want to close by saying, there is of course a lot of historical value to each of these religious movements. They all built off a common framework, but the differences between them provide a really interesting glimpse into the values and fears of average people in these times and places, whether that's a French invasion or rising crime rates. But more moving to me, I think the life of Joanna Southcott and all those prophets who came after her is a testament to what ordinary people can do when they're motivated. None of these people came from great means, none of them had great resources, they didn't work their way up the ladder of companies or governments, they had an idea, and with raw charisma were able to inspire hundreds to follow a common vision to great and terrible ends. People often talk about the impact that one life can have on others, and I think Joanna Southcott typifies that. 
She could have been a swindler, it's true, but I think she really wore her heart on her sleeve. She'd always gone out of her way to have her works and her beliefs scrutinized by the religious mainstream. When she was pregnant, or, you know, pregnant, she received all kinds of gifts from people who were so excited for baby Shiloh. Some of these were worth hundreds of pounds, which would be tens of thousands today. Silk slippers, a coral rattle with silver bells, a crib decorated with gold. Her followers gave her gifts fit for a king. And she promised that if there was no baby, if this were all some trick, she'd give every single one of them back. And I've read that in those final days, when it became clear she was going to die, she wrote that she was heartbroken because she'd been deceived by the devil all along. And in her will, sure enough, are rows and rows of names, all the followers to whom she remorsefully kept her promise. While she may not have been one for the history books, while her followers may be few, like extremely few, there are people, even today, who are deeply moved by what she did. And I have to wonder if she ever could have imagined that when she was on her deathbed, grieving for her life's work lost to Satan and the child who never came.